You are listening to Insights from the Conference Board. Welcome to this edition of the Conference Board's Insights podcast about our recently published report, Navigating the Global Talent Tsunami, Rethinking Strategies for Finding the Right Talent. My name is Robin Erickson, and I'm the Vice President in the Human Capital Center at the Conference Board. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Barbara Lombardo. She's a Distinguished Principal Research Fellow, Program Director, and most importantly, a valued friend and co-author of this report. Welcome, Barbara. Thanks, Robin. Well, we know that in the U.S., workers are resigning in droves. It's the great resignation, the great reshuffle. My favorite term is the great escape. Voluntary turnover has been at a 20-year high for quite a while. Uh, When we started this project, we were surprised to find that there were talent shortages in mature economies around the globe. In fact, employers in Europe and Asia are already having severe or growing difficulty filling positions as unemployment is decreasing, even in those countries with historically high unemployment. In terms of background, talent acquisition has undergone significant change in recent years with evolving artificial intelligence technology, but especially as a result of the abrupt shift to remote work for knowledge workers at the onset of the pandemic. Remember when everybody had to be locked down and and work from home if they could? But we know that simply performing talent acquisition better and faster will not serve the current challenges of finding the right talent and retaining that right talent amidst a global talent shortage. So Barbara, how can organizations find the talent they need and how did we approach the study? Robin, just as you said, talent acquisition can't just keep doing it better and faster and hoping that they'll get you know, the outcome they need in this labor shortage. That's just not gonna work. I think our overarching finding is that leaders need to encourage their teams to fundamentally, and I would say even kind of radically rethink some long held assumptions about who can do the job, when, where, and how the work gets done, and even the talent acquisition function itself. And one thing that struck me again and again, as we did our research, is some of these assumptions are so deeply internalized. Those of us who you know work in talent acquisition, think about talent acquisition a lot, we don't even realize we hold these assumptions. And those are just the ones that we're saying need to be revisited. And rethinking these assumptions, not only will yield more candidates, bigger candidate pools in the short term, but they'll result in more agile and diverse talent pools and more agile and diverse organizations in the long term. So there's a real upside to taking this new approach. Our research identified 11 strategies that organizations can implement to navigate these challenges that are coming with the growing talent shortage. And by the way, that shortage is one that the conference board itself predicts is going to last for quite some time. So these 11 strategies fall into these the three categories you heard me mention. First, rethinking who can do the work. Second, rethink where, when, and how the work gets done. And finally, rethinking talent acquisition itself. So you also, Robin, asked me about our our approach, our methodology. Our fundamental research question is this. What can CEOs, CHROs, and human capital leaders do to help their organizations find the right talent both now and in the long term? That was our focus. And to address that question, we conducted a series of five focus groups. We had more than 70 talent acquisition and talent management executives participating in these groups from across Asia, North America, and Europe. So we truly got a global perspective. And we also drew on key insights generated from the many surveys, the rapid response and other surveys that the conference board has conducted since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, one other thing, Robin, I want to mention before we launch into describing our 11 strategies. These 11 strategies that Robin and I are going to share with you are by no means an exhaustive list. And we also recognize that not all of them apply to all industries or all job roles or all geographies. You know, some will apply to more than others. So we see these as kind of examples for you, and we want to encourage you to use them, be inspired by them, to think of other ways that you could identify 
and revisit and overcome all those those assumptions about you know how we source candidates that we have lived for so long we forget we even make those assumptions so that's our wish for you well and thank you for that setup barbara and i couldn't agree more that hope is not a strategy and so we do hope that these 11 strategies will be useful at least some of them like you said to our listeners so let's start off with the first premise rethinking who can do the work well, as Barbara very eloquently said, traditional talent acquisition is predicated on many long-held assumptions specifically about who can do the work, including assumptions about prior experience, conventional candidate pools, and traditional candidates. So the first strategy is to rethink the how organizations should seek skills instead of just experience. So most searches for experienced hires focus on former experience targeting those who performed the same role in other organizations or those who are ready to move up to the next level. For example, to fill a sales role, recruiters typically seek candidates with a proven track record of sales experience. Instead, think about evaluating the skills that the work requires and target candidates that from other pro professions that might have those skills. For example, many veterans have the self-discipline required to build and drive a sales pipeline based on the work that they did in the military that has actually absolutely nothing to do with sales, but many of the skills are the same. The second strategy is to hire for potential. Today, organizations are being forced to become increasingly agile. There's nothing like the agility that we've had to show over the last two years. And therefore, so are employees. So we believe that technical and process skills are relatively easy to teach but motivation and attitude are not. Um, someone either has the motivation and the right attitude um, or they don't. So if you're able to determine that a candidate is a good culture fit and has a history of quickly expanding his or her competencies in a role, you could consider them as a stretch candidate. It sounds difficult, but research has shown that 93% of high performing talent acquisition functions encourage hiring for long-term potential. So with that, Barbara, do you want to take us off on the next? Sure, Robin. Look at populations that have historically been overlooked as hiring candidates, often because of stigmas or challenges associated with hiring these populations. Examples include people with disabilities, migrants, refugees, the formerly incarcerated, college students, retired seniors, even alumni, employees who voluntarily left the organization in the past. If you look past this, those stigmas and challenges associated with some of those populations, you can really find, it, you can tap into much broader talent pools than you're able to otherwise. Another population to consider and I know some of you use this um, to some extent, but I think it can be leveraged even more extensively, is to consider hiring freelance workers and independent contractors. In one of our focus groups, an HR leader from a global delivery company shared with us that they're radically rethinking the hiring of independent contractors as drivers. They used to just never even consider hiring contractors, especially those who worked for their competitors at the same time. And given the talent shortage, they're rethinking that. And with success, they're hiring drivers, independent contractors as drivers to do their delivery routes, ones who are concurrently employed by their competitors, and it's working. The last strategy in this category of rethinking who can do the work is to revisit traditional hiring credentials you all know, you know, in times when candidates are plentiful, most of our organizations use an academic credential, like, like a bachelor's degree, for example, as a filter in our applicant tracking systems. And that just helps us, you know, reduce the number of qualified candidates and get our arms around, you know, a shorter list. But in today's tight labor market, almost half of the respondents to a recent conference board survey said that they're going to be relying more heavily on alternative credentials for hiring such as um, certificates of competency. And for those of you who are listening and are members of the conference board, we've got a report on alternative credentials. And Robin, I, I wanna confirm this with you, but I think that's available to members on our website, is it not? It is, yes. Great. 
So those are just a handful of the strategies in the category of rethinking who can do the work. So let's move on to our second uh, rethink, which is rethinking where, when, and how the work gets done. Thanks, Barbara. And uh, it will come as no surprise to our listeners that uh, flexibility is probably the number one thing that employees are looking for today. We've, we've seen overwhelming evidence that employees want some choice and flexibility about whether and when to work from home or the office. As Barbara had mentioned, we've been doing a lot of surveys and we have a lot of survey data on these topics. But one of our surveys revealed that more than one third of workers may leave their jobs within the next six months, driven by a desire for flexible work arrangements. So basically, employees are voting with their feet and they can do that. Uh, when unemployment is low and there are a lot of jobs that are available. We also found that 80% of respondents cited work arrangements as very important or important in their decision to leave their current job. So we also then asked the question slightly differently, which was what was the most desired aspect of a new job? And respondents ranked a flexible work location as the most desired aspect of a new job. So the next question is when? When can the work be performed? Well, workers are also looking for flexibility about when they work, especially hourly workers, because typically there hasn't been that much flexibility. And during the pandemic, when so many people were laid off, many employees had to change their working hours to manage dependent care or to do different things. Think of all of the restaurant workers who worked different shifts in order to fill to-go orders, right? So it's important to think about the hours that you're asking your employees to work, whether they're industry and manual services workers or your office and professional services workers. We also know that some organizations have abandoned the concept of an eight-hour workday. They're focusing on outputs rather than inputs. Other organizations are even experimenting with a permanently shortened work week. In fact, uh, apparently they've just launched in London the world's largest pilot of a four-day work week. So that'll be very interesting to see what those results are. But, um, you know, because obviously productivity matters and so does employee satisfaction. So it's not, this isn't just an issue with remote workers. And um, schedule flexibility is becoming increasingly important. If you think of the popularity of ride sharing programs, the best part for the drivers I've asked them is that they can work whenever they want to. They, they work as soon as they turn on their app. And so uh, that, side, that idea of a side hustle and being able to work when they can and when it's convenient is becoming increasingly important. So lastly, when we ask the question, how does the work get done? We need to think about redesigning job roles in ways that expand the pool of candidates. So there's an assumption that one person does a set of tasks in a specific job role. But if you rethink that assumption and think that perhaps you could have that position filled by more than one individual, it would create new opportunities for employees. So, for example, you can implement the concept of job sharing. You could have two or more individuals perform the work, traditionally performed by one. And I know that some organizations have gone so far as to have the employees who are job sharing actually share desks when they were all working in the workplace. And it can go so far as intra-organizational employee sharing. In our research, we heard about some organizations that when they had to stop using their recruiters to uh, the beginning of COVID because they were freezing all their hiring. They actually put re their recruiters in different roles in the organization um, to use the skills that they had. If, if for, for in some cases that was outplacement and others that was in customer service, but uh, they didn't want to lose all their recruiters. The other one is just think about this one. You can also redeploy your workers inter-organizationally. So an employee could work for more than one organization at the same time. So uh, with that, that's um, our second premise. And our third one then is rethinking talent acquisition itself. So Barbara, why don't you walk us through that? Thanks, Robin. I'm happy to. And this next strategy that I want to describe is really one of my favorites. In several of our focus groups, members talked about making everyone a recruiter. 
Now you're probably thinking, yeah, we do that. You know, we have, we have recruiting referral bonuses and, and many companies do, but while paying referral bonuses to current employees who refer qualified candidates is, it's a pretty common recruiting strategy, especially in some uh, professions like consulting, referral bonuses have not been applied to all jobs or given to all employees. So we heard about the Asia branch of one global financial company that implemented a campaign that they called Each One Pledge One. And they really meant that every employee, every job role, pledge one potential candidate. And think about using your employees and, and their you know, vast networks and all of their insights about what it's like to work at your company and leveraging all of that you know, toward recruiting. But there's a couple of things that we think are important to have in place if you're gonna take this make everyone a recruiter approach. First, you need to provide your employees with current and accurate information about job openings and qualifications. Not everybody does that, but you know, they need to know what those, those openings are and what the qualifications are for them very accurately if they're gonna be successful recruiters. And also strong incentives need to be in place as well to get employees to generate, you know, their, to, to focus their energy on recruiting and identifying referrals. Those referral bonuses, they need to be substantive and recruiting and referral activity ideally should be integrated with performance goals. So along the same lines of leveraging your current employees toward addressing your labor shortage, we recommend, and this is an, our, a next strategy for us, looking at uh, internal mobility and having CEOs and HR leaders really get their talent acquisition teams thinking about internal candidates. Internal employees make great candidates, but the biggest barrier for them is that a lot of managers hoard their good employees for fear that they won't be able to achieve their goals without them. So there's a, a lot of uh, behavioral challenges to this approach. And in addition, we found that potential career pathways are not well-defined at many organizations. Doing that kind of career pathing is still a relatively new practice. And even when they are, career management initiatives are often managed independently from recruiting. So there's, and there's minimal coordination between them. So those who are looking at internal, you know, their own internal career path may not be even be aware of what's available to them because it's only being posted externally. So by removing those kinds of structural and behavioral barriers, organizations can really reap the benefits of internal hires. And those are many, you know, you're gonna get highly, highly motivated employees. There's the retention of institutional memory that comes with leveraging internal employees and increased employee engagement and retention as people really see a, an upward trajectory for them at their current employer. Um, once again, internal mobility is a topic that the conference board has a paper on, focused just on internal mobility. And I think that was just a year or two ago, Robin, I'm pretty sure you were a co-author. And I think that report is also available to members on our website. It is indeed. And uh, we actually have written about internal mobility quite a bit. Barbara, to respond to your comment about the importance of internal mobility, one of the interviewed HR leaders from a global technology company told us that they've been holding internal career fairs to recruit recruiters. They're trying to build interest with staff and other HR positions in becoming recruiters. And uh, we thought that that was incredibly clever because someone who knows the organization will be a great recruiter. So we thought that that was a great idea. In addition, Many organizations are frantically recruiting recruiters to help address extraordinary levels of recruiting activity that have been going on now for quite a long while. Um, but they haven't been rethinking how to optimally organize the work of recruiting. So while requiring investment, artificial intelligence or AI technologies can help by increasing the efficiency of the recruitment processes, by improving employment branding, bolstering the recruitment marketing strategy, improving the hiring experience for both candidates and hiring managers. AI technologies can help with optimizing sourcing and enhancing the quality of the candidate pool. And they can usually do this all while driving down costs and streamlining boring and repetitive tasks. 
the beauty of AI technology is that it takes the routine tasks and uh, automates them. So there's the recruiters can focus on the more important aspects of their job, like actually talking to candidates. And in one of our focus groups, an executive from a global technology company said that they recognized that their recruiting teams, they were aligned with separate business units, were essentially competing with each other for candidates with the same skills and experience. So they're realigning their recruiting work around the skills and experience being recruited for, such as coding or IT infrastructure maintenance. And that allows recruiters to focus their efforts on one specific talent pool and to avoid internal competition. Barbara, what was our last strategy? Robin, our last strategy is really somewhat a word of caution. And that is, and Robin and I talked about this a lot as we developed our, our paper. So once you've applied these different strategies that we've talked about and you've found the best criteria to find the right candidate for your organization, our word of caution to you is reconsider salary increases. During labor shortages, it's so tempting to rely heavily or even exclusively on that lever of salary to attract candidates and get them in because we're, you know, some of us are feeling rather desperate about filling some of these open job roles. But while higher salaries may make sense as part of an overall strategy, we really caution against relying on them too heavily. And, and here's why. Current employees often become really disenfranchised and more likely to leave when they discover that the new hire doing the same job as them is being paid more than them. Recent data from the conference board show that flexible work arrangements are almost as important to new hires as salary. Many employees value strong managers too, like having, having a good manager, having flexibility, having high employee engagement, joining a company whose culture they feel, feel good about, they value those things much more than salary. So higher salaries alone will not be sufficient to attract talent and even more, you know, there may be some downstream challenges that they create. So Robin, before we close, I just want to say again, you know, just to reemphasize that these 11 strategies are really not comprehensive. And what we really want to encourage all of you to do is take this mindset of rethinking your assumptions your assumptions about who can do the work, where, when, and how the work gets done, how talent acquisition itself is done. And I think that if you use that mindset, you'll come up with strategies of your own as well. Completely agree, Barbara. And uh, it was really fun to work on this because we all know that finding talent these days is more difficult than ever. Uh, we actually have data that shows that as well. But uh, we just encourage you to think about some of these 11 strategies. And uh, as Barbara said, think, using the mindset of rethinking assumptions. And uh, we predict that you'll have some success with that. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us. That concludes our podcast for today. I'm Robin Erickson, and I'd like to thank Barbara Lombardo for both co-writing the report with me and joining me today. Many thanks to our listeners for tuning into this conversation. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our Insights podcast series or explore the entire catalog of podcast programming from the Conference Board on your preferred podcast streaming service or by visiting our website at www.conference-board.org slash podcasts. We hope you'll tune in for our next episode and hope that you have a great day. This has been Insights from the Conference Board.